All right, latecomers need permission slips, you know. Uh oh. I, it might. Oh no, this is really a gift. Does this make me an April Fool? It is my birthday um, on April 6th. That's a, a, almost a week away. So, okay. Now, now, now my hairdresser is going to be upset with you. Thank you. Thank you for that. What happened to the lights? Lights. We want the lights back on. Yeah. Welcome to Astrology Night at Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond, Washington. Um, for those of you sitting here, you're getting it live. For those of you on the internet, thank you for your continued support. Last month, we had, we had nearly 28,000 people who watched this event that you're at, 28,000 people. So thank you to all of them. Um, we're approaching the beginning of our eighth year doing this event here at Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond. And I'd like to begin by thanking Soul Food and, and the people who make this space possible for you all to attend and for us to do this here. Um, this is Astrology Night for April of 2015, and before I jump into the uh, incredible stuff of the month, and I know I say that every month, it's always incredible, um, there's two things I'd like to do. I'd first just like to give um, an acknowledgement uh, to Jeff, who, as you know, um, uh, transitioned a couple of months ago nearly. Um, we had an amazing celebration and, uh, and sending off for him um, about a week and a half ago. Um, and, um, and even though he's not here physically, Jeff Jower is always here. And so I just wanted to acknowledge and, and, and mention that so he doesn't just think he can, you know, escape this realm. You know, it's our way as humans of holding on to those poor bastards that have left. <laughs> You know, it's like they think they get to go, and they do. But as long as we love them and appreciate them and conjure up their names, they kind of have some piece that still kind of comes recycling. So um, here's to Jeff. Item of business one. <laughs> Item business two, I would just like to share with you here and the people online um, some of the events that I have coming up because not everyone can get to Redmond, Washington, um, in order to join us um, here. So um, on the online version, I'll have more information for these various events. But the weekend of April 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, that's not this weekend, but the following weekend, I will be at the Great Lakes Astrology Conference in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So those of you who are Detroiters, is that a right word, Detroitians, um, come on out to the Great Lakes Astrology Conference. There's information online. Google it, uh, G-L-A-C or Great Lakes Astrology Conference. Um, I'll be speaking at that conference, and I'll be doing a full-day Monday workshop for um, for people whether or not they've attended the conference. Uh, next shot will be the first weekend in May in Tucson, Tucson, Arizona. And for those of you in that vicinity, this is sponsored by the local um, Tucson Astrology Association and more information available through them. The last weekend in May, Memorial Day weekend, is NORWAC, the Northwest Astrology Conference. It's one of the most fun, funnest, is funnest a real word? Well, good, I'm using it. It's one of the most funnest of all the astrology conferences. Um, there's usually around 300 attendees, speakers from many countries, including often Australia this year, England, France, um, and I will be teaching a class and doing a Saturday night keynote talk 
Actually, um, it will be uh, the Jeff Jauer Memorial Talk on Saturday night at Norwalk. Um, summer solstice weekend. How many people here say solstice and how many people say solstice? Solstice. Solstice. All right. They're both correct, but it's like, you know, orange and orange, orange, orange. On summer solstice, I like it because it has the word soul in it. Um, on summer solstice weekend, I will be doing a Friday night lecture and an all-day Saturday workshop in Minneapolis sponsored by the local NCGR, that's the National Council for Geocosmic Research, um, chapter in Minneapolis. And so those of you in that area would love to see you for that event. Um, Mid-August, I will be back at Lilydale. That's the uh, center of the uh, American Spiritualist Church. And that will be a Wednesday night lecture around the 15th of August. I know this is a little far away, just putting some markers on the map. And then the end of September, exact dates will be arranged in the next week or so. The end of September, I will be leading a, an eight-day-long astrology retreat, experiential astrology retreat, in Bali, if anyone has not been to Indonesia and is looking for an excuse to spend a week in paradise having fun with enough time to absorb some of the local culture, temple rituals, and so on, um, keep your eye on that one. It will be my fifth um, workshop retreat in Bali, and they're each and every one of them very cool and magical, and I'm looking forward to it. Okay, what's that? It's, it's going to be the, the end of September into the first week of October. The exact dates are not set yet, but they will be set in the next week or so. So, thank you for indulging what uh, Click and Clack call the Department of Crass Materialism. I was like Click and Clack. I don't know whether I was Click or Clack, but now I think I'm either Clickless or Clackless. All right, so here we are on April 4th, 2015, and we are standing in an interesting place, not in space, that would be here, but in time, that would be now. The interesting thing about this moment in time is that we are just coming out of, of, of a shoot, um, of a birth canal. That's really what we've been in for the last several years, beginning, in fact, with, with Uranus's move into um, Aries and then the origin back in 2010, 2011, and the first of the seven Uranus-Pluto squares that happened in the spring of 2012. And the seventh and final Uranus-Pluto square occurred in mid-March of 2015. Technically, emphasis on the word technically, technically the Uranus-Pluto squares or square is now in the past. However, if we look at historical precedence to this, for example, the Uranus-Pluto conjunction, which defined the 1960s. The Uranus-Pluto conjunction in the 60s occurred in the summers of 1965 and 66. And certainly there was tremendous action going on at that point in time with revolutions at Berkeley, the student revolt, and, and political unrest, and the war in Vietnam beginning to secretly you know, heat up, and civil rights movement, and so on. But it wasn't until 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, and even into 71 when then perhaps it began fading off that the real action of the Uranus-Pluto conjunction occurred. And by the same token, even though technically the Uranus-Pluto square is now in the past, the lag of seasons, you know, the reason why the hottest day of summer is not on the first day of summer, it's not until July or August or even sometimes September, and by the same token, the lag of planetary seasons dictate that the real powerful and most profound events 
of the Uranus-Pluto squares, of which we've seen many already in the past you know, two, three, four years having to do with gender issues, um, with medical marijuana and the rights of uh, individuals to control their own consciousness, um, ecology, GMOs and global warming, social, political unrest, uh, um, and, um, and so on. I mean, the issues are, are wide and they're similar issues to what the issues were in the mid-60s. However, even though our head has crowned and we are now out of or coming out of the birth canal. It's going to be days, weeks, months, even years. I don't think we really understood what happened in the 60s, maybe until the 80s or 90s, looking back. And so we do not have that perspective of, of retrospection yet that will take a few years and the events and the energy will continue to build. So here we are in April of 2015 at the threshold of something that's post Uranus Pluto. And yet we don't have a clue yet as to what this really means and how this is going to play out. This is important piece one. Now, bringing it back to just like we have local space where we are, we have local time. The Uranus-Pluto cycle is a cycle of, of centuries, not months like a moon or years like a solar cycle. So we have, we have bringing it back to a local time perspective, we also need to understand that we are right now not only at a tipping point, but we're kind of, what's that saying, betwixt and between. We're, we're, we're no longer there and we're not yet there. We're betwixt and we're between two eclipses. We had a total eclipse of the sun um, on March 22nd, on the first day of spring, at the very, very last degree of Pisces. And this was a very powerful transformational eclipse. And now, today is April 4th, on, um, on April's, on, uh, today is April 1st, I'm getting ahead of myself already. How Aries of me. <laughs> Today is April 1st, and on Saturday, April 4th, we have a total eclipse of the moon. This is a full moon or a lunar eclipse. And a lunar eclipse occurs when the Earth comes between the sun and the moon, and so being in this period, I've, I like inventing words, and the word that I've invented to describe this period that occurs usually twice a year between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse, or between a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse, and my word is intra-eclipsical. <laughs> it ain't in Oxford. But I think ain't is, finally. I grew up, did you remember, ain't isn't a word. Could, don't use the word ain't. It, it ain't a word. Well, I hate to tell you, ain't is a word. Intra-eclipsical, however, is my word. So, eclipses rattle the energy. I like to think of eclipses um, as uh, polarizations. In other words... Imagine that you have electrical light in a room. Ha, good imagination. We do. William Blake once wrote, or he wrote, what once is proved, let me do that again, what is now proved was once only imagined. What is now proved was, is, <laughs> hope it's not going to be like this all night. <laughs> what is now proved was once only imagined. So here's the imagination. We have a room with electrical lights, but these are very slow-moving electrical lights, and it takes, it, it takes two weeks to turn them on. So the switch, is, so it's dark, and it takes two weeks for the lights to come up, which is the new moon to the full moon. And then it takes two weeks for the lights to go off when you flip the switch. It takes two weeks for that light to go back off for it to be completely dark. This is the normal lunar cycle. Are you with me? Make sense? During an eclipse, 
that cycle cycles in the matter of minutes or in the matter of hours, depending on whether it's a solar or lunar eclipse. What I mean by that is that a solar eclipse, when the moon comes in front of the sun and the lights go out, in a way, that happens in a period of a, a typical solar eclipse totality lasts two to five or eight minutes. And so what happens is that the light just comes off and on. I mean, normally on the day-night cycle, it's 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. But here, all of a sudden, it's like someone's grabbed that light switch and is just going on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And that's the way I think of an eclipse. It's the polarization of that flipping of the switch. And it can create an epileptic fit. Now, what I mean by that is epilepsy is, is, is a disease of the nervous system where there's this rapid, uncontrollable cycling of energy that's no longer in control. And this is what happens during an eclipse. At least this is one way of looking at it. So that during a lunar eclipse, it's taken two weeks for the moon to become full, and then in the course of a few hours, the moon is dark and then it's full again. And so it tweaks our brain. Oh, I heard a good, it's, it's, a, it's a brain wedgie. <laughs> Sigrid, thank you. Sigrid, who works here, said that word this afternoon. I said, I never heard that. Is that like a, a word? She goes, it's my word. I go, okay, can I use it? She said, yes. But that's what it's like. It's like, it's like a neurological brain tweak. So, in traditional astrology, eclipses, like many things, don't get a good rap. I mean, when you look at ancient astrology, life was hard. You know, and a, a certain, you know, Mars conjunct Saturn, death by a wild dog. You know, I mean, how many people do you know? I guess people do die that way. But at one time, that was actually a real concern. Our concerns are different these days. Um, eclipses often signified the fall of a king or some change in power. Eclipses kind of rattle the energy and shift it. And I look at eclipses as having a Uranian influence. The planet Uranus is the planet of lightning striking. We'll talk about Uranus more in just in a, in a few moments. But remember, Uranus has been squaring Pluto on and off for the last you know, several years. And even though technically the two of them are now past their exact conjunction. If we look at a chart for, for tonight, April 1st, we can see that Uranus is at 16 degrees and 11 minutes. That's about 16 and a quarter, 16 and a quarter degrees into the sign of Aries. And Pluto is at 15 degrees and a half, 15, 29 minutes, 15 and a half degrees of Capricorn. What that means is that they are still within one degree. They're still within, they're actually three quarters of a degree or 45 minutes of arc from being exactly 90 degrees. And this is a cycle that's a several hundred year, a couple hundred year cycle. So we give this some room, the astrology word is orb. We allow it an orb. My word is slop factor. We give it a slop factor. The universe is not as exact as our minds would like to think it is. There are no exact cycles. We like to round things off and make them exact. Okay, so we have this Uranus-Pluto. Uranus is moving faster than Pluto. It does. So Uranus will move 16, then 17, then 18, while Pluto is still plodding along here at 15, eventually getting to 16. And so that's why over these last few years, Uranus has moved into the 90 degree, that's that red line, into the 90 degree square with Pluto. Uranus, the planet of shock and awe and electrical, you know, um, lightning, um, awakening. When the light bulbs go on and the nerves fire and you go, I got it. Epiphany, awareness, illumination. These are all Uranus words. Pluto, on the other hand, is, works on a different time cycle. Uran um, Pluto is, is slow-mo. Pluto, Uranus is an 84-year cycle. Uranus is weird. Its north pole faces the sun. 
I mean, it's like a bowling ball. It's, everything about Uranus is weird. Pluto, on the other hand, is a 250-year cycle, four times a millennium. That's how slow it is. Okay, it's 243 and a half years or whatever. 250 is close enough for us. Now, Uranus functions instantaneously. It's that immediate revolution, rebellious, surprise, shock. In the moment, Uranus, here and now. Pluto, on the other hand, is like a glacier. Now, if you compare the power of a tsunami to the power of a glacier, and you measure it over the course of 10 or 15 minutes, who wins? The tsunami. It has amazing power. You look at the Christmas full moon tsunami, you know, uh, in Indonesia a few years ago, or or the, um, the Fukushima tsunami. I mean, that power over the course of a few minutes is amazing. It's incredible. However, Which has more power, a tsunami or a glacier? A a tsunami will take out a town. It'll knock down all the buildings. But a glacier will take down the whole damn mountain. It may take four or five or six hundred years. And it may move so slowly that you can't even see its motion. But Pluto has to do with this relentless, unrelenting, never-ending pressure that keeps pushing, pushing, and it's transformation. It's the, it's the metamorphosis of one thing into another, like the metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a butterfly. It doesn't happen in that same moment that an unaware person gets Jesus, or Buddha, or awareness. That's like Uranus. That's, <coughs> the lights go on. That's nervous system. It's electrical. But for a caterpillar to become a butterfly, there is a gradual process, and there is no way to make it instantaneous. So these last several years, when Uranus has been squaring Pluto, we've seen the squares are conflict. They're stress between two different energies. And we've seen this dynamic stress between the need to have all the change we want to have right now, Now, revolution, freedom, awakening, opening, and Pluto going, uh, we got centuries. We are a glacier. We're going to take down the mountain. But you don't necessarily see the change moment by moment. We're not in the same place we were a few years ago. But it may not necessarily feel that way yet. Now, um, bringing this up to date now, I just want to point out that over the next several days, If you watch here, the sun, which is faster moving than Uranus, if you watch, here's today, April 1st, watch that sun gain on Uranus. There's the sun at 12 and Uranus is at 16. There's the sun because the sun moves about a degree a day. There's the sun at 13. There's the sun at 14. There's the sun at 15. There's my birthday. Happy birthday, Rick. Happy birthday, Rick. And the sun is exactly conjunct or lined up with Uranus, which means that over these couple of days, the sun will first square Pluto exactly on the 5th and then join up with Uranus on the 6th, giving us an instantaneous flashback to the technical Uranus-Pluto square, which is over. Have we started again? Or are we taking... We're, we're taking a technical 10-second break. Or maybe not. <laughs> How human to take advantage of things. <laughs> Tell me when. So, I wanted to lay some solid groundwork for what's happening now, because it's rather extraordinary. And in some ways, this is a microcosm of what will continue to happen over the next year or two as faster moving planets. And when I use the word planets as an astrologer, I use it in the ancient Greek meaning of a wanderer, which includes the sun and the moon, and in fact, Pluto, regardless of what labels they get by fashion. 
or science. So over the next months and years, as the faster moving planets like the sun, like the moon, like Mercury and Venus and Mars and even Jupiter, but we're now getting out to the slower moving planets, as these faster moving planets line up with and make conjunctions, that's an exact alignment, or squares, that's 90 degrees, or oppositions, that's 180 degrees. When these faster moving planets make alignments with Uranus and Pluto, even though they're no longer exact, it buzzes back that energy because there's like a harmonic resonance to when they were exact because over the course of a couple of days, the sun will first square Pluto and then conjunct Uranus. And even though they're a degree apart, we get it over a period close enough where we can feel it almost as a singular energy. Now it gets interesting because on April 4th, and let me just back this up a little bit so we can get the exact or close enough. That's close enough. We have the full moon on April 4th, which is exactly at 5.05, that's five minutes after 5 o'clock in the morning, Pacific Daylight Time, which would be um, um, 8.05 New York time, and uh, even a few hours later if you're in England. So, the full moon on April 4th is when the moon is opposite the sun, However, the moon, compared to even the speed of the sun, is coming through high speed and squaring Pluto and opposing Uranus. Can you see this? So in effect, this full moon, that's this Saturday, is going to re-energize and re-stimulate all of the social, cultural, economic, political, personal, relationship stuff that we've been going through for years. And you'll probably see some of this even in the news. But that ain't all. Because this full moon is a very particular full moon. It's also an exact eclipse of the moon, which means that it's a total lunar eclipse, meaning that the sun and the moon and the earth are all in exactly the same plane so that the earth casts its solar shadow onto the moon. And if you can see it, and in fact we will be able to see it very early in the morning, the eclipse will not play through here until it's already dawn. But if you get up on Saturday morning before dawn, you can actually see in the western sky the full moon beginning to set and it will be blood red. Now, lunar eclipses are not that uncommon. I've probably seen a half a dozen of them in my lifetime, um, and, uh, and all you need to do is know where they are and go out and look, look at them. You know. If it's dark during the full moon you, and there's an eclipse, a lunar eclipse, you can see it. The solar eclipse, however, is different. Solar eclipses make very thin paths along the Earth, and if there's a solar eclipse, rarely do you get to see it. If it's a total eclipse, you have to go to where the path is. I actually did go to and see a total eclipse of the sun in the very south tip of England in August of 1999, and it was quite an experience. But if you were in London, just a couple hundred miles away, less than that, there was no total eclipse. So this full moon is a, an eclipse but it's not just an eclipse. It's an eclipse that involves the Uranus-Pluto square. And therefore, and it's also my birthday. <laughs> well, my birthday is a couple days after. I'm in Aries. I get to say it's my birthday. Oddly enough, I don't really celebrate it much, but I like to talk about it. Okay. So what does this mean? Eclipses rattle time. They're, they're again, think of that light switch going on and off. And, or blinking a lot, you know, that strobe kind of effect. And it's just like things become out of whack. 
I, there, I used the word earlier, I said eclipses are Uranian. There's this kind of dzz, an awakening, a jolt. Um, it, it, often, if energy is blocked or stored up, often eclipses will free that energy, which is why they get a bad rap. If you live in a, uh, in a repressed society, if you live in a repressed or suppressed personal um, uh, container, then when those energies are freed suddenly, it's not necessarily a pretty picture. Do you understand why these energies are not viewed in traditional classical astrology as something good? However, I would suggest that if one has a spiritual practice, if one is living with, with, with a lean towards increasing awareness, then eclipses can be absolutely magical because they kind of temporarily create this mm, like warp factor. You know, in the, in the old Star Trek, all of a sudden, vroom, everything's different. And time speeds up. Oh, my God. Isn't time fast enough already? Well, this in some ways is beyond time. And so my suggestion for, for those of us who are here and now or watching this prior to the eclipse on April 4th is that we still have some time. We have a week or so that's still an opening to push and to force those events which we've wanted to happen because, because if you don't, one of my laws of how Uranus works can be summed up with this statement. If you don't take responsibility and act like the lightning, you will be a lightning rod and attract it. Think about this in your life. How many times have you had an accident or something happened or someone suddenly did something either to you or said something or, or whatever that in some way felt out of place and sudden and you didn't expect it and yet when you look at it you realize that there was stuff that was hidden or buried and no one was talking about it and all of a sudden the lightning struck and it, everything came out in the open. Well, that's, that's how eclipses work. So, um, we have a lot of other stuff I guess got close to my mouth and seemed really loud all of a sudden. We have a lot of others. It's like talking in a bar when there's a band on. And you're talking and you're shouting over the music and all of a sudden the music stops. And you sound like... <laughs> yeah, same kind of thing. So we have a lot of other stuff going on this month. But, but these two eclipses become really significant because in a way they are still part of the crowning of our head through this Plutonic birth canal. Remember, Pluto, although it's glacial, is, is metamorphosis. It's the birth of the butterfly out of the death of the caterpillar, but it's not death and birth as we normally think of it. It's, it's a focus on the, the bardo states, which is what the Tibetan Buddhists call it, those states of existence where there is no, um, no, carna no incarnation. There's, it's just states of pure thought. And, and in a way, Pluto is the states between the ending of one cycle, whether it be even our lives, and the beginning of another cycle, even if it's a rebirth. And so in some ways, we are coming out of this birth canal, and we still do not know what we're doing or where we're going, and we're in a formative period of time, which is why we're spending so much time here talking about this. Now... Moving on through the month, so by, by April 4th, 5th, 6th, the sun on April 5th is exactly squared to Pluto. And then by the 6th, oh, we're moving here slowly, hour by hour. We need to change this back to day by day, and there we go. Okay, so now we have by April 5th, the sun is very closely square to Pluto. You can see how fat that red line just got. And then by, whoop, we're going here by a week. Time gets away from you when you do this on a computer. There we go. Okay. So then by the 6th, um, the sun and Uranus are exactly aligned. The moon has moved on. The eclipse is over. But this is electrical. 
This is, this is awareness. This is freedom of choice. This is independence. Um, and I will close a little later with a poem that is a poem about Uranus that kind of talks about how instantaneous Uranus is and how it works that way. So we have on April 6th the sun conjuncting Uranus, but I want you to pay attention to Mercury, which is here in Aries also. The other two personal planets, um, Venus and Mars, are already ahead of the sun. They're moving faster than the sun, and they're already off into Taurus, which is why this year, because two of the three personal planets, Mercury, Venus, and Taurus, being ahead of the sun in the next sign, it already feels later in spring than it already is because we're getting this Taurus energy where spring settles in is actually warmer. I mean, we think of Aries as beautiful and warm, but often in many parts of the Northern Hemisphere, spring can be rather cold and bleak. I mean, there's, there's more light, but the, but the buds and the life really doesn't begin to flourish astrologically until we have planets in Taurus, which are more earthy and sensual and beautiful. So we have Mercury still behind, behind the sun, which means that over the next few days, even though the sun moves away from Uranus and away from uh, its square to Pluto. If you watch Mercury, now Mercury by the 7th and by the 8th, Mercury comes into the picture and Mercury squares Pluto on the 7th and it conjuncts um, Uranus. Well, actually, it conjuncts Uranus on, on early on the 8th. So the 7th and the 8th, we get another zap of this Uranus-Pluto square, but this time it's not the sun, it's not our being. It's Mercury, it's our mind, it's our thoughts, it's our ideas, it's our communication, it's our nervous system. So we may still be really buzzed and electrically kind of wired through the 8th and the, by the 7th and the 8th. However, as we move on, the next important change that we want to talk about is that by the 9th, Mercury catches up to the sun. Can you see how Mercury on the 9th is um, uh, at 18 and the sun is at 19? And Mercury is now moving faster than the sun. And by the, by the 10th and the 11th, Mercury is at, um, it begins to separate. Mercury is at 23 degrees, then 25. Mercury is moving almost two degrees away. And if you just watch that Mercury, see how it gets further and further away from the sun? So on April, on April 9th, Mercury actually lines up with the sun in Aries. Mercury is the mind, it's communication, it's thoughts. The sun is our intention. On these days, we're having an incredible alignment of intention and will and communication. If anyone here thinks of themselves as wizardly, or witchy, or magical in any way, these are the days to do your magic. These are the days to voice your intention. Sure, the new moons are important around, you know, they're important for the beginnings of cycles. However, when Mercury lines up with the sun, there is a clarity and an intensity that the light of the sun and the mind are in line. And our words can be more focused. What we say is directly in line with what our will, our sun, our consciousness is. So these are important days for us to work this. Um, by the 11th, we have a couple of changes on the 11th through the 14th. The first thing that happens is that Venus moves from Taurus into Gemini. Venus moves from Taurus into Gemini. I really need a Vanna White. When Jeff and I did these together, he could talk and I could point, or vice versa. I suppose I could use the mouse, but somehow it's not quite as real as pointing. Anyhow, um, 
Venus moving from Taurus into Gemini. This is another zap of the next layer of spring. There's, there's movement. There's buzz. Uh, Gemini is a communication-oriented sign. And over the next couple of months, we will talk about both more, more about Taurus and about Gemini. Right now, we are talking more about Aries as the first step, the beginning of the life coming out of the birth canal, um, that, that kind of first burst of energy. So... On the 11th, we have Venus moving into Gemini, but then that's followed on the 14th with Mercury moving into Taurus. Now, we're kind of setting the tone for the sun's movement into Taurus. Just a couple of days later, the sun moves into Taurus on the 20th. And you can see that by the 20th, we have all those planets which were clustered in Aries. Now we have a pile-up of planets in Taurus. And here's the deeper meaning of the shift of this time of year. We're coming out of Pisces, the end of winter, the, the garbage collector refuse of the zodiac. Everything washes into the sea. And that's Pisces. It's the greater ocean. We're all fish swimming around in this big ocean. In Aries, we're birthed onto the shore. And we have an individual trajectory. In Taurus, it begins to gain solidity. And by the end of April, with Mercury and Mars and the Sun, and actually just for a bit, we have the moon there also. And the new moon, interestingly enough, on the 18th occurs while the Sun is still in Aries. We've been in this cycle for several months now where the new moon has happened at the very end of a sign rather than at the very beginning. That'll, be, that'll shift. And in a way, it's like wanting to get ahead of ourselves. It's, it's like we're, we're off into, into Taurus land, but, but we're really being birthed back in Aries. And so it's, it's, it's an odd juxtaposition of time that I think goes back to these eclipses that just creates these, these weird kind of cycles within cycles that are at different speeds. This new moon in, in Aries... Um, is exact on April 20th at 2.40... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, it, on, on April 18th at 11.56 a.m. here in Seattle, that's Pacific Daylight Time. So just before noon, there's the exact um, new moon in Aries. However, it doesn't last long. We get this impulse to create, to do something new, to start something... And almost just a couple of hours later, the moon moves into Taurus. And then the following day, actually on the 20th, early on the 20th, the sun moves into Taurus. And then we're kind of like slowing down and making it work. We're grounding out our energies. We're, we're being more uh, down to earth. Taurus, the bull. Taurus, the bull that when it's not moving, you ain't going to get it to move. And when that bull is moving or when the cows are going back to the barn, you ain't going to stop them. I don't know if anyone ever spent any time on a farm around bovines, but when they have energy going either in movement or not movement, you're not going to have them change direction really quick. And if you know Taurus is in your life, if they're laying on the couch watching the game or watching a movie, if they're sleeping, you're not going to get them up any faster than they're going to get up. But if they're mowing the lawn or doing a project and you want them to stop for dinner, forget it. They're in motion and they're going to continue doing what they're doing. Fixed sign. Um, by April 21st and 22nd, we get an interesting um, zap from Mercury and Mars, which in Taurus are moving. Mercury is moving faster, and Mercury catches up to Mars. When Mercury catches up to Mars exactly, it is on April 22nd. But on the 21st, we're already getting them. Um, we're, we're, we're getting them kind of on the 21st and the 22nd. Mars and Mercury make a harmonious trine to Pluto. And that's this big, thick red line. And here, the energy is practical. It's grounded. It's down to earth. Pluto is like a resource. It's like a battery that never dies. It's the power of the glacier or the power behind a volcano that even after one eruption, that power is still there, the intensity. And so 
um, by the end of April, the sun has moved into Taurus. We're getting this feeling of, you know, the, you know the song, uh, the Ravel Bolero from the movie Ten. It's not from the movie Ten. The movie Ten is from it. But Bolero builds like a bull. It starts off soft and it builds and builds and builds. And we forget that the that the young energy of spring. Even though Taurus is a feminine sign, it's related to Venus, that there's a building energy behind it. And we're feeling it this year early on in Taurus, especially as Mercury, the communicator planet, lines up with Mars. And we're going to say what we're doing. We're going to talk about it. We're not going to be stopped. If there's issues we need to express, we're going to express them. And we got the generator from Pluto going in a harmonious trine. And these could be some really powerful days. Um, by the 22nd, Mercury actually catches up with Mars. Then it moves ahead. Um, during this period also, um, we're beginning to anticipate the next round of change. Venus has moved on into mid-Gemini, and by the end of the month, Mercury, jump ahead, Mercury pops into Gemini also, and by in May, we will see both Mars um, and um, Mars and the Sun move into Gemini, which kind of scatters the energy, and it makes it more playful and more whimsical and has more movement to it, kind of like that kite on a spring day. So um, looking at this month kind of, you know, as, as, as a whole, it's important to understand that we are on a bit of a precipice, but we don't know what we're falling into. Just like the baby as it's being birthed has no way of knowing the life ahead of it. It's still living, even though it's in this world, there's a part of it that's still in the experience of floating in the womb and the rudeness of being here now. And, and so in a way, over these next weeks and months, we may have some of that same experience. And, and I think that what happens is that um, that as the planets build up their, their power into Taurus, that the craziness, is anyone feeling crazy these days or see it around? I mean, I, I, and of course I don't mean the clinical craziness, but I mean just that wired energy. And, and it, yes, it's spring. And to quote one of my favorite poets, E.E. E. Cummings, the world is mud luscious and puddleful, puddle wonderful. And it's spring, you know? This is a cool time of year because there's a buzz. But behind that buzz, there's like, it's like the buzz behind the buzz. And the buzz behind the buzz is the fact that Uranus in its long-term stay in the sign of Aries, when the sun is moving through Aries, it's picking up on that buzz and we're all a bit crazy. And the solution to that craziness is not in suppression. If you feel a little crazy, good. That just means you're in tune with what's going on. If you don't feel a little crazy, then I would suggest that you may need some therapy. <laughs> because you're probably in some state of denial. Craziness isn't bad. Anyone, I mean, it certainly can feel crazy or bad while we're going through it. But, but I would recommend reading something like... Um, um, Knotts or uh, R. D. Lang, um, the the, um, the psychology of um, the psychology of experience. Is that what the, his book was? That's, I think. Anyone know? Um, who talked about how the psychotic episode was actually a break into illumination and awareness, and that many people who are institutionalized are not crazy. They're having Kundalini chi flushes, they're experiencing something that in another culture might be considered natural, and if they were taught to dance with it and move with it, that they might not end up being, you know, electroshocked and, and drugged like in our culture. So if you're not feeling crazy, I think it's good to fake feeling crazy a little bit. And if you're feeling crazy, understand that in this breaking out of the status quo, of the, of the structures that bind and restrict us, that in breaking out of these kind of restraints, 
that that is where the future lies and that is where the seeds for what's ahead um, comes from. The seed, that's where the seeds come from. Now, as I promised, I want to share with you this, this poem because I think it in some ways it's the best, it's the best job that I can do um, to kind of give you the sense of how this Uranian energy works. And it will just take me a moment here to get it. And I am almost there. We need some background music. Okay, we don't really. That sounds familiar. I'm having a flashback. Did we do that last month? That's scary. All right, Eclip eclipsical. Okay. The, the name of this poem is Present Tense. <laughs> and if anybody wants a copy of it, either anyone here or anyone who might watch this on, on the Internet, if you want a copy of the, the, the words to this, please send me an email, rlevine at stariq.com. Um, this is a poem that I wrote many years ago, and... Some poems that I write kind of come and go, and they go, oh, you know, that was a... But some of them kind of, like, hold their... They justify themselves over time, and this is one of those. And, it's, and even though there's no mention of the word Uranus in the poem, it's about Uranus. And if you understand this poem, you understand how Uranus works. Present tense. The lightning hits... The shift is now. I close my eyes and take the vow to release the future and the past, to focus on the present vast, extending through infinity, extending far as I can see. The lightning strikes. The sky lights up. The waters pour forth from my cup. The feelings pour forth from my heart, as from the past, my life does part. The walls of safety tumble down, my head goes spinning round and round. I'm standing high out on a ledge, I leap onto the razor's edge, where form can split and separate. Ambivalence turns to love and hate. Where unity is sliced in two, choice shows us what we must do, where issues are forced, so we must choose something to gain, something to lose, something feared, something desired. The pressure to choose makes me grow tired, something we want, something we fear. Excitement mounts, the moment grows near, time speeds up and my heart beats fast. I fear this moment will not last. But then I remember the razor's edge and the illusion of feeling like I'm on that ledge. You see, the moment of now is all that exists. Create past and future, then something resists events in the future that hurt long ago, creating rough water in time's river flow. For time is a river that flows to the sea. The storm waves dissolve if we just let them be. When the past and the future are locked in desire, the rapids build, the waves grow higher, but it's all in the mind, for the ledge is unreal. The fear of the fall is the fate that we seal. The razor is safe if we stay here and now. So I release unborn futures. Let me do that again. The razor is safe if we stay here and now. So I soften my vision and repeat my old vow. I release unborn futures, letting go of the past and the infinite present grows cosmically 
vast. <sighs> Happy April. Today is like everyone drew the fool card <laughs> out of the tarot deck. It is the April fool. It is the Aries baby who is innocent and doesn't know any better than to practice the goal of Zen, beginner's mind. Happy April Fool's Day. Thank you again to Soul Food and to our baristas, uh, the, the barista brothers, um, Aaron and Tyler. And I would like to say that we all, and I know I say this often, we all can uh, vote with our, our, our wallets by showing our appreciation and buying the gifts that we might buy at some department store here by buying an extra cup of coffee. Um, these events, um, Astrology Night and many other events uh, here at Soul Food are free. And the way we can make sure that they stay here and free is by supporting those who support us. Um, one last thing is that uh, we'll take about a 15-minute break. We'll come back and we'll do three charts. These charts are, even though you might get picked, uh, they are not the same as an individual consultation. They are for instructional purposes. So even if your chart isn't picked, hopefully everyone gets to learn something out of seeing these other charts being done and taking the cosmic weather that we've been talking about and applying it to individual lives. Um, the if you would like your chart done, um, I fill, put up, I have these little slips of paper. Put in your name and your birth date, place, and time. Um, make sure you put your time of day. Um, also, your email address will get you on my mailing list. And I think now I've said everything I need to. Thank you all again for your attention. And for those of you who are either hardy or addicts or just plain foolish or have nothing better to do with your lives, I'll see you in 15 or 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.